Yes, yeah, yeah, so I was. Uh, so we are having some community members here. I was telling people that we are going to talk about endometriosis after menopause, and that's a, such an important topic uh, because it's even worse in terms of misinformation and lack of understanding. It's worse than typical endometriosis in the community of like younger people because of so many reasons that we are going to actually discuss tonight. And I'm excited to have uh, you, Dr. Vasilev, and all of you who are in this live. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a great conversation. So before I hand it over to Dr. Vasilev, please feel free to drop your questions. Hi, Sofia. Uh, drop your question already. Um, you can drop it in comments or questions section. I'll make sure to ask all your questions um, before the session is over. And, and hopefully we are going to have a great conversation. Dr. Vasilev. Uh, please tell us and, and the people who are in this live about yourself a little bit so we can kick off this conversation. Sure. Thanks for, for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Yes, well, he hello, everybody. Uh, we, uh, I'm trying to uh, improve my sound thing here, but uh, if we end up with shrieking audio, uh, I am a gynecologic oncologist who really has shifted a lot towards endo over over a decade, really. Uh, my training, and some of you have, have seen GYN oncologists before, they do tend to focus on cancer. Um, I have focused on that, of course, uh, many years, but because I've really been, over the years, pulled into a lot of more difficult, complex uh, pelvic surgery, endo being uh, one of them, and because of some overlaps with uh, ovarian cancer, which, frankly, I'm one of the few in the country that does that robotically. That is very, very similar to what we do in um, endo in terms of having full excision. There, literally, life depends on it. Here, reducing pain depends on it uh, and uh, preserving organs, too, like kidneys and so forth. So um, in my case, a lot of overlap uh, to uh, become that. and. My bent is a little bit different in that I'm also boarded in integrative medicine, so I inject uh, that kind of um, um, strategy uh, into helping uh, people. But as far as the surgery itself, it's uh, obviously very challenging. I've had a lot of referrals where I've felt that, you know, there's, there's people out there, but apparently they're hard to find. So I'm uh, available and uh, essentially made myself more available because I'm seeing a lot of folks that need that. Uh, so essentially, uh, that's uh, kind of my story. I'm also involved in research, by the way. So we could talk about that later, but... Uh, of course. Thank yeah. you. So before we dive into questions, I want to ask the people who are in this slide, please drop your questions in the comment section or in, in question section. So we are, we are having a top expert who, is a special, who has a specialized and has been vetted for multiple categories of endometriosis. So if you have any question about um, pelvic, extra pelvic, menopause, cancer and endometriosis, just drop your questions out here. We will make sure to get to them. I want that those questions to come early rather than late because last session we, we couldn't answer all of them and some people went disappointed. All right, so Dr. Vasilov, I want to dive into the discussion. This is um, mostly the focus of the discussion will be on you and your opinions on, on different topics. And can you tell me, it's just for me, I'm curious to know, uh, when in your training did you have the first exposure to endometriosis? And, and what, was, what went through your mind when you had that? Well, I mean, the initial exposure is, of course, in medical school, but it's kind of book knowledge. That's about it, really. And uh, in OBGYN residency, we uh, learned, of course, more about that, but it was, especially when I trained, fulguration was kind of the standard of practice, even though I trained at USC where we had kind of a mecca of reproductive endocrinology. Um, it, it was still kind of backwards now that we know more. And to me, as a budding oncologist who you know was involved in resection of things rather than burning things, um, you know, thing, it just never made sense. And it wasn't really until I was a beyond a fellow in GYN oncology that I um, really saw the parallels there. Uh, but uh, basically, the first exposure was 
kind of wrong, basically, uh, in residency. And a lot of my colleagues who never go beyond residency in OBGYN really never, never really study these kind of things and what makes a difference. And of course, there's a lot of literature out there that says it doesn't make a difference, but that's just not true. Um, so we can talk about that some more, but that's basically my first awesome. exposure and so forth. Thank you. And can you, so you, obviously you, you read about it in medical school, then in the residency, I assume you had uh, some of the trainings, probably most of it in the wrong direction compared to what we know now. But at what point did you decide that you got to learn the standard of surgery for endometriosis, which is excision of endometriosis? And, and like what, so that's, and what led you to go in that direction to become an expert and help people? It's, it's like a personal thing that I'm curious about. Yeah, I mean, to, again, to me, it never made sense to burn things. There's, in oncology, there are some surgeons that also do burning of lesions, but it's just a, an incomplete way to handle anything. So honestly, I can pretty much say that beyond the training where I was, beyond me standing there with a faculty person who was saying, just burn this thing, um, I, I never did that. It just wasn't in my DNA. That's not what I did. Uh, so uh, while I wasn't uh, an expert on it back then, um, I obviously gained that over the years. It, it just was completely anti everything I knew about uh, removing diseased areas, essentially, of anything, and certainly endometriosis. Um, so yeah, the training back then was largely medically focused also. And actually in today's residencies, it's even more medically focused and less surgical. Probably most people know the gynecologic surgeons just do less and less surgery these days. So um, it's not, um, it's just not a focus unless you go beyond that. Right, great. Um, so let me, let me dive into the questions that we are gonna discuss about endometriosis. And I dive into the first question. And this is like, is it true that endometriosis go away after menopause? So the answer is in some, uh, maybe, but over how long and what do you really mean by going away? So if you operated on everybody after menopause, what would you really find? Unfortunately, studies like that have not been done um, because to operate on people who don't have much in the way of symptoms that just is unethical, essentially. So we use the proxies of are you having pain? Are you having some other issues uh, and so forth? Um, but that is rooted in the principle that somehow at menopause, you know, the clock start stopped at midnight and all of a sudden all the estrogen goes away and all of a sudden there's no endo. That is, is false in, in many, many ways because for starters, even though endo uh, is driven by estrogen, uh, estrogen doesn't go away after menopause. And we could talk about uh, that a little bit more later. But because of that and the time it takes over years really for the estrogen to kind of drop unless you're taking estrogen uh, is one thing. And the other is, we can talk about this some more later also, is fibrosis, the scarring, how your body handles endo. It does not stop because your body's trying to heal naturally. And unfortunately, the fibrosis, your body can handle a little bit, but not all of it. So sometimes help is required surgically and things like that. So, I mean, again, the, uh, the answer is no, it, it does not go away. It may become less symptomatic in a lot of patients, uh, but uh, that could be a little misleading. Um, and so everybody's an individual. Really, that's the way you need to approach this. Right. Can you, like, because you're on this topic, can you tell us what are the typical symptoms that you would see or would expect to see in a person who is pre or post menopause and they might have endometriosis? What are the symptoms that they would present with? Well, the typical, of course, uh, things you hear about is pelvic pain and certainly painful periods, um, heavy periods. Um, sometimes bowel symptoms, things like that. Uh, certainly, it is very common that pain is not the presenting symptom. It could be bowel symptoms, everything from bloating to pain after eating in the upper intestinal tract. 
Uh, so it's uh, it's almost like a disease that is uh, is mimicked by others and vice versa. So it always has to be kind of considered when you're having strange symptoms of almost any kind because endo can go anywhere. Um, typically, it's mostly in the pelvis, but it can obviously go elsewhere, cause trouble breathing if it's on the diaphragm, things like that. So when you're premenopausal, it is very common, of course, pelvic pain, painful periods, and some intestinal stuff. When you get postmenopausal, um, a little bit different, and it's also unfortunately confuddled a little bit because people are now also afflicted by menopausal symptoms, uh, like um, you know, hot uh, hot flushes and sweats and mood swings and things like that. It really is uh, it just multiplies the problem because the pain may not go away and so forth. But on average, though, it can be very much similar symptoms, although I can tell you as a prelude of what we may talk about a little bit, people forget about adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, very often persists in a very painful way. And I've, I've operated on a number of patients postmenopausally where that was really the main problem. It's endo in the uterine wall or adenomyosis. All right. Yeah, so I, so I get that. So because you mentioned... Um, like bowel symptoms, bloating, or, or urinary symptoms. Uh, can you explain a little bit, like after menopause, that's why I'm mostly interested in, uh, after menopause, what are typical behaviors of endometriosis in bowel and ureter? And before you dive into the question, please, I'm asking all the audience here, drop your questions. I want to have a sense of what are the questions. So we'll give it enough time at the end to answer hopefully all of the questions. So please start dropping your questions in comments or, or questions section so we get to them one by one after this uh, part of the discussion over. So sorry, Dr. Vasilev, go ahead. Um, I, I just interrupted you, uh, please. No, it's all great. Yeah, we're looking forward to all the questions. Um, as far as uh, endo and ureters and uh, bowel goes, the, the problem with the ureters part is that it could be silent. Um, so either endo growth, and hopefully we'll talk much more about why does endo potential menopause, but if it's either growing or staying the same, fibrosis is, again, your body's way of healing. When fibrosis occurs around or near the ureters, it can obstruct them. That is not a painful process. So you can show up in the emergency room 10 years later with a blocked kidney, for example. Now, is this common? No, but if you're asking, you know, what can happen, that's, and you're kind of just trying to wait endometriosis out and then figure you're kind of totally in the uh, clear after menopause, uh, bad things can be happening while your body is trying to do a good thing in terms of healing. So that fibrosis is a big, is a big deal as far as that's concerned. Around the bowel in the small bowel area, not so much, but in the rectal area, since endo grows uh, a lot in the pelvic uh, region, uh, fibrosis in that area as well, as well as growth, but you know, focusing on, on fibrosis a little bit, it can constrict the rectum uh, and cause everything from uh, small stools, constipation, um, Bleeding sometimes also with a sick, you're not going to have cyclic bleeding at this point because you're postmenopausal, but you can certainly still have bleeding rectally. So the rectal symptoms is what is most likely as far as bowel is concerned postmenopausally. Okay, I get that. So um, basically, it's probably the, we are going to deal with more complications of bowel and and and, and basically. The yeah. urinary tract and dementia is postmenopausal because it has had a longer time. That's, uh, thank you for explaining this. Um, the other thing is, uh, so why, why would so many doctors say, and, and some of them really believe, that endometriosis is, is going to disappear after menopause? And that's what they basically train patients or like they like send patients away because they they think or they believe that it was going to go away and that they are doctor they are from that position of authority patients trust them why why so many doctors do that what's the thought process what's the training process behind it well uh, 
the thought process in general, again, is if you shut down estrogen, you're going to get rid of endometriosis, both premenopausally, where we put people into menopausal states still, uh, which is not the best for certainly premenopausal folks, but postmenopausally, it's happening that happening naturally that estrogen could potentially be um, tapering down. But as I kind of alluded to early, this does not happen overnight or over a week or over a month or even over a few years. This can happen over five years or more. Um, the problem is also, it's not like you have X amount of estrogen and we know exactly how much endo it can activate. We don't know that dose response curve, if you will. And, you know, you can talk about that with medications. You take more medicine, you may get a better effect. We don't really know what that is in endo. So you can have a relatively small amount of residual estrogen, which is easy to discuss. We'll talk about that some more as far as where this is coming from. But it can easily feed endo and continue its growth, uh, albeit maybe at a lower rate, but it could certainly continue. So um, that's really the problem, that the, 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 the mis misperception is the estrogen goes away, therefore no more problems. That's just not true. Um, I don't know how much you want me to get into where is this estrogen coming from and things like that. Uh, I'll ask that question after we answer some of the questions that we receive from patients, because I hate to see patients go away without answering, but estrogen is, my, is exactly my topic and actually... Ali is asking after he's straight to me. So, all right. Um, so we are going to dive into questions from patients at this point. I have a couple of more questions from myself and, and from like other people that I asked that I have uh, asked to give me questions. So I'll ask, we answer the current people in the live, uh, their question, then we go back to my line of questions. I will start from the questions uh, from the top comment section. Uh, I know many people have already dropped the question here. Um, so there is like they had the recently we have had uh, in some news about new French startup with this saliva test about endometriosis. Uh, I don't know if you did you read about that company and their findings and do you have thoughts on it? Um, I know it, it hasn't been as widespread news, but it has made some some noise around the community. Uh, can you share your thoughts with us, Dr. Vasilev? Is that uh, out there are a number of tests that are kind of um, getting there, but they are not going to be there for a while. And many of them, again, are based on what the uh, estrogen levels are, which, again, is kind of misleading. Um, I don't know about the specific one you're talking about. Um, we are looking, we being the scientific community, are looking at, uh, for example, microRNA signatures. That sounds like a mouthful. But essentially, it's looking at markers that DNA produces that doesn't create proteins or anything, but it, it creates signals uh, that can cause endometriosis growth. And those can be tested for. There are some companies that are doing that. It's just that it's more in the research mode um, and not yet in... Um, in standard of practice, not even close, really, because the problem is something called sensitivity and specificity. Both of them have to be high, or you're going to get misleading results. Either right. falsely something's there, or falsely something is not there. Uh, right. So I am not aware of anything that has a particularly good sensitivity and specificity right now. In five years, this is going to change. I almost guarantee it, but uh, not yet. Right. So, Viola, if, if you have more specific data or, or understanding about that test, drop it here. I'll, I'll bring it up later on with Dr. Vasilev. So, the other question, so obviously so someone has asked, uh, her symptoms mostly happen during the cycle or basically flare up during the cycle, and that's probably the peak of their symptom. And when the, if the cycle ceases, which happens after menopause, what symptoms would continue and, and when, would you, when would they flare? So uh, endo uh, at its core is inflammatory um, and depending on where it is, so around bowel um, in particular, in the pelvis, uh, any inflammation that the endo that's persistently growing or the fibrosis is replacing it with can fire nerve endings essentially, but on a more continuous basis. 
So it, it kind of converts to more of a, uh, a chronic dull and sometimes sharp pelvic pain, but usually kind of a continuous pain, essentially, that's seemingly getting worse and worse and worse. And it is because the fibrosis is happening. Um, so that is different from patient to patient because the degree of innervation peritoneal area is also different. Uh, this is why my, my theme to everybody really is that uh, nothing is off the table. Different, very different. Um, are you still on there? Uh, you, you yeah, there are some pauses. I don't know what's happening. Um, guys, do you, do you see Dr. Lassilev or do you also see the pause? Oh, okay. I think, I think you're back. Do you hear me? Uh, do you hear me, Dr. Vasilev? I think you're back. No. No, you don't hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I hear you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, my internet signal is just literally bouncing back and forth. I have... Long story. Anyway, if you can okay. hear me, awesome. Uh, did yes. I finish that explanation or not? Yeah, so you said, uh, so the, you, you were there that fibrosis can happen in bone cancer, but then I, I lost the track of like how the flare up can. Yeah, so can the fibrosis the fires the nerve endings or growth of endometriosis persistently. So while there's maybe no cycling, the inflammation uh, from these, um, the process basically of slow growth and fibrosis leads to more of a chronic pain. And sometimes a very, very increasing chronic pain, basically. Uh, and again, a lot of that can be the adenomyosis, the uterus itself. Uh, so uh, we are ki quite often, actually, on MRI, find evidence of, of adenomyosis. And the radiologist doesn't even comment on it sometimes because it's like, well, yeah, but you're postmenopausal, so it doesn't matter. That's not true. Uh, it can definitely be active adenomyosis in the uterine wall uh, as well. So, again, more of a chronic pain syndrome type of thing. But, again, everybody's different with the degree to which your pelvis is innervated. That's the problem at the peritoneal level. Right. All right, so the flare-up to answer to, this is, I understand the flare-up can happen due to the fibrosis impacts on the nerve endings. And also if that's adenomyosis, that's a whole different story. The flare-up is gonna be there um, one way or another. So the next question Sophia asked it, uh, is that what about cancer and endometriosis? Are we, I, I, I assume it's like mean, mean, meaning endometriosis patients, are we prone to cancer? So before I answer that, just to finish the last one in terms of the inflammation, remember inflammation, again, is, is endo at its core, inflammatory, but other inflammatory anything can cause that inflammation to get worse. Mm -hmm. That could be related to toxins. It could be related to your diet. It could be related to maybe you also have diverticulosis, uh, anything else can also kind of synergize with an inflammatory effect. So that's why you may have flares as well. So there may be a couple of things going on. As far as cancer is concerned, that, you know, scary topic and the party line based on the studies are that it's a very infrequent, very uncommon, uh, you know, less than 1% uh, increase. That's true. Uh, however, a couple things. One is if you have an increased familial risk, somebody in your family has either had ovarian or breast cancer or even on the male side, prostate cancer, um, or you've been tested or somebody in the family has been tested and they're positive, that definitely elevates. If you um, also, as you get older, there's definitely um, biomarkers, genetic markers that overlap between cancer, um, something called ARID1A, one of those markers, uh, and endometriosis. So we know that it does increase your risk, but the chances are still small. So how small? Well, I was talking about a fraction of a percent. Sounds like very low, but when you're talking about millions of women walking around with endo, then even a percent or half a percent or a quarter of a percent 
means there's a problem out there. So as an oncologist, unfortunately, I've, I've seen quite a few either clear cell cancers that come straight from endo or due to ovarian cancer degeneration. So this is not meant to be a kind of a panic call. Um, it really, it's just meant to be, you need to be aware of these things, especially if you have a family history of any kind um, that really, we, that's part of our assessment. We do genetic testing when, uh, when somebody gives us a history like that. And that impacts what we do with the ovaries and what age and so forth. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question comes from Tara and, and, and she asks, is there any hope to have more endometriosis specialists? Because there are, there are very few in this country. Are the medical schools putting more teaching focused on endometriosis? What has been your experience, Dr. Vasilev? So there are a number of, um, so we talked about general GYN not particularly focusing. When you go to an average gynecologist, they're focusing on obstetrics, delivering your happy babies, um, doing some basic GYN. It's not possible for them to keep up with everything. So going to a regular GYN when you think you have endo or if you do have endo is just generally not a great idea unless they spend a lot of time specializing in it. Reproductive endocrinologists, some, spend more time learning about the um, hormonal part of it. But unfortunately, reproductive endocrinologists have moved away from surgery. Literally, when I was training, it was very common for them to do a lot of microsurgery. They just don't do that anymore. They're focusing on assisted reproductive technology, getting embryos and uh, harvesting eggs and things like that. So who else is there? Well, there obviously is a um, growing subspecialty of um, excision surgeons who Basically, under the uh, it, it's it's not a board certification type of uh, fellowship, but it is definitely a fellowship that is sponsored usually by the AAGL and and some other societies uh, internationally, where folks spend more time, uh, especially with minimally invasive surgery, doing endo excision. It then it, it unfortunately the there's uh, you know there's there's a range of people that come into the fellowship and how long is the fellowship? It's not tightly regulated, but there's hope from that, that there's that input. G1 oncologists are um, kind of at the pinnacle of surgery for anything related to women's health, including cancer. We operate on every organ and so forth, but most G1 oncologists are not tuned into endo and they're not really interested in it and they're focused really mostly on cancer. Also, they usually are not doing what I mentioned in terms of um, minimally invasive excision of, of anything other than like taking a uterus out for endometrial cancer or something like that. So there are very few folks like, um, well, there's a handful doing ovarian cancer cytoreduction, reduction, for example, but they're out there as well. So the more a GYN oncologist is tuned into doing um, minimally invasive cytoreduction reduction of cancers, the more they're also going to be helpful, especially in very difficult cases where there may be a, a you know, frozen pelvis and very difficult resection. So GYN oncologists should be on the list, but unfortunately, again, maybe many of them do it through a big incision uh, or are just not interested or don't understand endo very much. So um, that doesn't sound very encouraging because what I'm telling you as well, it's kind of a flux of people coming in, right. but it's uh, um, the point is for the future, I think there's a lot of hope because there is a, I think, a huge um, interest uh, going on right now, a lot of awareness raising. This is kind of unprecedented. So I think there, you're going to be seeing more and more coming from all these directions, um, but we're definitely not there yet. Right. And from our perspective, from I Care Better, we are trying to stand up for a standard of care for endometriosis. So patients and advocates in this group, if, if you are listening, like probably what we need to do is to, um, to help doctors understand there is a new standard. And, and that's like we are basically carrying the flag and they can come learn from I Care Better doctors and and we offer that education. So we are trying to fill the gap that Dr. Vasilev does just, just, just described. 
Go tell your doctor, do you know about endometriosis? Do you understand that endometriosis has a specialized training and a specialized skills that you might not have? And I tell them to go learn from us. So I move with that, I go, I go to the next question. Uh, Violet had a stage three endo, which was excised seven months ago. Uh, she couldn't sleep on her side pre-surgery and still after the surgery, cannot sleep on that side because of rib pain. Is this possible that the symptom is because of endo, like the rib pain is because of endometriosis? Is this a possibility? Did you say rib pain, right? Rib pain, so, yeah. It, it depend, uh, well, the obvious question would be how high was the port? Was it anywhere near the rib that was put in for either laparoscopically or robotically? But, and also where was the endo, if there was endo on the underside of the diaphragm or not, and if it was resected in that area or not. Um, that's the main thing. Uh, but the other is even if the port was lower, um, the, uh, you know, this is minimally invasive surgery, no big incision. However, you're basically getting stabbed with an object and that object can go through a muscle and hit small vessels and those vessels can bleed and that causes inflammation and that goes into the rectus muscle which is, goes right up to the rib cage. Uh, so that uh, can definitely uh, cause uh, discomfort. Is it gonna go away? Well, your body definitely clears that, that blood that could have accumulated there so the inflammation over time goes down. Except remember our old friend, fibrosis. That's part of the way the body heals. So sometimes uh, it can heal with fibrosis around one of the nerves that uh, you know is triggering pain. So the answer is, I think in most people, it will go away. There's plausible reasons why that might be there, um, but um, and not in everybody. So it, I would suggest that if it doesn't go away, your body remodels for a solid six months or really up to nine months. But if it's six months really, or earlier, if it, it just seems to getting worse, uh, I would recommend getting rescanned, um, either with a CT scan or an MRI. Okay, great. And, and potentially see another specialist um, with the expertise in that region. And the next question is, should hormone replacement, it's, it comes from Chris, should hormone replacement be used after surgical menopause and excision of endometriosis? So probably she has gone for surgical menopause and, and she has an excision. And what about uh, fetoestrogens, fetus, fetus uh, fetoestrogens, basically? So uh, that the latter part is more kind of like um, stem cell therapy, essentially. Um, we're off in the fringe there on that one. Um, the uh, the other part, as far as uh, hormone, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to discount that. We're looking in a lot of different areas. A lot of it is research based. Um, if you're participating in a clinical trial that's looking at some of these things, great. If it's somebody that's just offering it because it seems like a good idea, I wouldn't highly recommend um, unorthodox approaches like that. Um, if there's a particular, you know, we're, we're all about kind of following up here. So if you have a specific uh, something, forward it to us and I'm happy to look more into it because I learned by doing things like this and teaching my residents who always ask me questions and so forth. So, uh, but in general, um, this is not likely to be helpful at this stage of the game from my knowledge of the, the uh, industry in that area, if you will. As far as hormone replacement therapy, um, it, it, that's a loaded question as far as, it depends on what you mean by hormone replacement. It could be estrogen replacement, it could be a combination of estrogen and progesterone, depending on whether your uterus is there or not. That has implications on um, breast health as well as uterine health. If you take only estrogen, it doesn't really affect the breast, it doesn't increase risk there, but it will increase the risk of uterine cancer. So then you got to take progesterone. If you take progesterone, it does have a negative effect on your breast, um, but it prevents uterine cancer. So highly individual. It depends on how long you're going to take any of this for. 
um, because, well, this, the, the developing standard is to go back to as long as it takes. We went from giving out hormone replacement like vitamins uh, to a complete kibosh stop with the Women's Health Initiative, which was wrong. It hurt a lot of women. Um, and now we're getting back to in appropriate dosages for appropriate lengths of time, which is individual, uh, you should continue with hormone replacement. That's the generic. As far as effect on endometriosis, again, remember what I said earlier about dose response. Um, in any given individual, giving them what is really a low dose of estrogen and progesterone uh, or estrogen alone, uh, progesterone is supposed to counteract the estrogen, but that doesn't always work that way. In any, because estrogen, well, remember, endo is not the same as endometrial tissue. It's different, so it can respond to progesterone and estrogen differently. Uh, but it's not. It's a. It's a matter of does that dose that you're getting, which could be very small, going to affect you and not the person next to you? And that's the difference. It really is going to be variable, and that's rooted in a whole lot of biochemistry, which is based not just on the dose, but what's going on with molecular signals in your body that affects something called the estrogen and progesterone receptors. If those become more active, then you need less estrogen to activate something. So there's a, a, a whole lot to this that is not simply turn it on, turn it off. Um, it's, just, it's just a whole lot of... Um, uh, attention that needs to be put at the in, uh, individual level, really. Okay. All right. Um, so and that's a question. lot of information. I hope it doesn't overwhelm folks. But again, um, it's um, it's very very. You got to look under the hood. That's a very very deep information. Anyway, go right. ahead. All right. So I, the next question is: Does early excision of endometriosis have good prognosis? Like, assuming if someone does it in twenty, does it? Is it better than doing it in than 40? Like, what's your uh, take on that and what's your experience? Yeah, there have been research papers on both sides of the fence of that um, in terms of should you uh, even diagnose early if somebody is asymptomatic. Now, why would you be doing that? Well, you may be operating for some other reason and find endometriosis or something versus symptomatic folks where you should at least make the diagnosis. If you're making a diagnosis, in my opinion, you should probably do a treatment if you can do it safely. So if it's the right surgeon uh, that can do a excision without damaging anything at a pretty good probability, then it's reasonable to go ahead and excise it because it's not going to hurt. There are patients, we know that from the literature, uh, again, these papers that have been published, that you find endo and you at 20, 19, younger, and you, go, you don't do anything about it, no consent or whatever. And then what happened to these people five, six, seven, eight, nine years later? And in a substantial percentage, not much happened. Why? Well, again, there's a whole lot of molecular biology going on that's individualized here that we don't have a complete handle on, but we're getting there, right? So, the, unfortunately, are you, am I frozen up again? You did, but now I think yeah. it's good. Okay, hopefully it'll keep going. Um, so I keep looking at my router to see if it's working. Uh, in any event, um, so in some folks, it's gonna make a big difference and some it won't make much of a difference at all. Uh, but I do think that on average, if you're there, you diagnosed it, you should remove um, what is there. It should, in most cases, lead to uh, less risk of rampant progression and hence the fibrosis that I was talking about and so forth. But unfortunately, we know in some people, you do have to have sequential operations. Um, you know, honestly, the papers out there and the research is just not good enough to tell, is that because the surgery wasn't any good? Or is that because the patient has a specific, specific uh, type of endo that is just going to progress and you need medical therapy of some kind on top of that? Again, very, very different from person to person. But overall, right. I'd vote for excision. Right, okay, cool. So something that's really, 
Uh, one thing before I, I, I want to say something interesting here. Dr. Wasif, we have so many questions and uh, we have uh, 17 more minutes. Hopefully we can answer all of them, but if not, uh, think about if you want to extend this like, for a couple more minutes. Uh, we'll talk when we get to the end of questions, um, but sure. we have probably more questions than time. But something that really stands out to me, Dr. Wasif, is the questions that people ask like in this community or other people around the is like so like spot on sharp like these are good this shows how well educated and well trained the people with endometriosis have become which is a really important driver for the whole change in training and treatment of endometriosis um so that's something that i wanted to put out the next question comes from stacy um so hysterectomy and adenomyosis and three, lapar three laps for three laparoscopy surgery for endometriosis. And she has had three cesarean section. Now she has interstitial cystitis and also um, never had relief from pain. She also has some GI issues and pain that in it goes into legs and swellings. Um, What's your take? Do you think endometriosis is still there? And what do you think she needs to do the next? So obviously, she is in pain and she is not comfortable. So she's looking for an answer. What do you think would be possible reasons and what the next step should be for Stacey? Well, you, you can tell a lot about how good the endometriosis excision was um, by... Am I still there? <laughs> am I still there? Okay. Uh, either by uh, looking at the uh, pathology report or the operative report or both. Um, that really kind of immediately gives you an indication of how good relative to the symptoms we're talking about was that excision. Um, so let's just assume it was a great excision. Can't get any better. Um, again, there are some that are definitely going to grow back uh, over time. So how do we without operating, how do we figure this out? Um, some of the leg and pelvic pain issues can be due to just inflammation related to, again, even the fibrosis post-surgical -surgic type of uh, situation. But um, the best known scan, and it's not perfect by any means, is an MRI. So the MRI is as good as it gets to look at tissue planes. You can, for example, look at the area where the sciatic nerve passes past the pelvis to see if there's any nerve impingement in that area um, with respect to the uh, pain going down the leg. Um, when you're talking about swelling, that could be either lymphatic or venous. Um, it would take quite a bit of endo or any other disease to create that situation. So there may be something else going on uh, beyond just the endo, uh, but definitely pelvic or pain going into the leg that could easily be endometriosis related. Um, as far as uh, the other symptoms, I mean, in the bowel area, the MRI is not as good except around the rectal area. So if it's specifically uh, rectal type discomfort, uh, pain uh, with defecation or something like that, then yes, it, it can help you. But um, if you have a clean MRI, you can't say there's nothing there. Um, but in my opinion, you should never go to the operating room having not done everything possible to have a prepared mind about what you're going to find and what potential co-surgeons you need with you. So for example, Having said what I said about what I do, which is pretty much operate on almost any organ, if I thought that the sciatic nerve was involved, I'd have a neurosurgeon work with me. Uh, so this is, uh, it's gonna give you a whole lot of information. If, if you just pull random specialists in, they're, they're not gonna be available as much, but if you have specific indications, then that's completely reasonable and they could be a co-surgeon, et cetera. So um, hopefully that helps uh, answer the question. Really, first, look what? at the op report and path report. Do you think, so do you think she needs to look at or do you think it's good for her to get in touch with an expert to have like a consult or something? Do you think, what, what the next step do you think she needs to take for this problem? Yeah, I, I guess I'm saying somebody that uh, understands the uh, medical ease of uh, 
a path report and a operative report would be able to tell you. Because, for example, a layperson can look at a report and it can have all sorts of biopsies. And they often list it as biopsy, even if it's an excision. But the pathologists tell you how much tissue was there. So if each one is like two millimeters or three millimeters, that means somebody was just pecking stuff out. And that may not be an excision, for example. And the operative report, again, that tells uh, a lot, but you have to understand what the anatomy is and what they're describing. So in general, of course, yeah, it would be, unless you're a physician or a healthcare provider, probably ought to get somebody to review it that's, a, uh, that's an expert. And that, your point is well taken. It can't be just any doctor, because any doctor can say, yeah, it looks like you've had surgery. It looks like they took out what they said, but it may not be, um, to the level that you need for endo care. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so the, the, the next question comes from Karen, and that question is, is it true that if you are dealing with endo after menopause, it may mean that your endo was more deeply penetrating to begin with? And how hard is that to remove? Uh, yes, it could. Um, certainly the longer endo has been there, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, not everyone has clearly progressive endo, but certainly it does progress, and it can clearly progress past that into menopause. So there's more and more of it and more and more of the fibrosis. The longer you get down that cycle, there's no question that it's going to be harder to remove. But almost everything is removable at a reasonable um, risk. Um, but for example, uh, if you operate early enough, you can essentially even take the fibrosis off a of ureter. Uh, and as long as that, well, you can't macroscopically always tell that is, is active endo or not, but pretty decent idea if you're moving the ureter out of there and you can get it out and it has good blood supply, you can still get it out. Sometimes it's encased in case to the point where you have to remove the distal part of the ureter and plug it back into the bladder. Is that horrible? No, it's not. And if somebody knows what they're doing, and that would be either a G1 oncologist or a team that has a urologist with them, for example, um, then that is easily relatively easily done. It sounds like a huge thing, but relatively easily. But if you can avoid doing that by doing it a little bit earlier and removing the tissue before it obstructs and before it requires removal of some part of an organ, the better. Um, so uh, waiting these things out, the, I guess, is the, the main thing that we're talking about is not a good idea. It's not likely that it's just going to go away. Again, if you have a little bit of endo at menopause and if your estrogen drops like a rock after that, you're not taking any endo afterwards, you're thin so you don't have any peripheral uh, estrogen production, um, you happen to have the molecular profile that I can't, you don't know, but potentially that it does not lead to more endo growth with low doses of estrogen, maybe you'll be fine. But unfortunately, you, you just, it's very hard to see. Um, well, again, some of those other things you can easily look at. Again, somebody has more fat cells, you can have more estrogen, et cetera. But you can't look at all the factors. Uh, however, you can look at a lot of them and try to decide whether um, earlier surgery is going to help you um, or not. Uh, most of the time, it probably will uh, in terms of forestalling major problems down the line. Okay, great. Um, so, a uh, question from Ali. Uh, Stacey, also I know you asked, uh, should expiratory surgery be considered after? So Stacey asked about the, the last question. Like, she, this is her next question is like, uh, for someone who has had three laps and she still has pain and I see, I mean, I think the explanation was that you should go to those MRIs and other consults then but with your expert, which needs to be an endo expert, you can decide if exploratory surgery might be an option for you. Um, I, I believe it's just you, you, your next step should be talking to an expert. And that's based on what Dr. Vasile said. Um, 
So with that, with that, I go to the next question, which is similar to the stasis question. So Dr. Vasil, I, I, I let you answer both of them together. The next question is, can a different surgeon see you after an unsuccessful treatment? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, I, I uh, so I, I, I discourage doctor shopping per se, because I, I mean, for many, many reasons. However, especially if you get into a situation where you didn't really know better, you kind of had surgery with somebody, they, they sound like they took out what they needed to, but you're still having discomfort, then of course, yeah, you need to get a second opinion. If you went to an expert who bona fide regarded as an expert and things just, and, and you look, you know, you have four experts review the op report, the path report, and basically they all say this was a bona fide good surgery. Then going to another one um, may not give you any more. And honestly, if you're going to reoperate on somebody, the best person for the job, if they're a skilled surgeon, is the one that already operated on you. Because they know what they saw the last time, they know what they did, um, there's, there's, it's just better that way. But on the other hand, if you, as I said earlier, if it's, it's somebody that may not have been expert, you look at the op and path report, and yeah, it's you know it's 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 kind of lukewarm. Then yeah, of course, a second opinion and potentially another surgeon uh, would be a good idea. You know, these days again, the surgery is um, surgery is surgery. It's a problem. We're not going to get to it today, but it's a whole lot better than it was um, even ten years ago. Um, we're not going to get into robotics versus laparoscopy today, I don't think. But bottom line is that the recovery time, getting out of the hospital and recovering at home is just getting so much faster that it's often worth the risk um, after an evaluation that says there may be disease left behind. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is that, in someone with adeno and endo, how to understand which one is causing more symptoms? If the, if the pain is primarily seemingly circulating around the uterus in terms of uh, painful intercourse, um, it depends on what in painful intercourse you're talking about, but this requires a, an evaluation and examination. But if it feels like moving the uterus is what's causing the pain. The uterus itself cyclically is causing you a lot of pain, heavy periods. Then you're more likely talking about adenomyosis. Um, there's definitely overlap because you can have uh, endo right at the uterus sacral is very close in, in filling the cul-de-sac, et cetera. Uh, but the more somebody just has those central symptoms, they really don't have interstitial cystitis symptoms, they really don't have any rectal symptoms, um, then the more likely it is that adenomyosis is playing a picture. <clears throat> Both ultrasound and MRI, but MRI is kind of a pain to go through, especially if you don't like clanging, banging, and claustrophobic and whatever. Uh, MRI is best probably from the research out there, but ultrasound is very good to give you an idea of whether you have adenomyotic pockets in, in the uterus. Parenthetically, I've had patients come to me um, with different ideas of what adenomyosis is. When you have growths like, fi like fibroids, but they're not fibroids, they're adenomyomas, that's one thing. When you have adenomyosis, which is literal, little, basically little pockets throughout the entire uh, myometrium, that's a different, that, that's transmural adenomyosis through the whole uh, uterus. And while the adenomyomas can sometimes be removed, harder than fibroids, but can be, adenomyosis can't be. Um, so it makes a difference as to what you're going to do as far as surgery is concerned. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask a question. The answer is, is yes and no. Yes or no. Uh, can endo be in the brain? Can endo grow in the brain? Yes. Unfortunately, it can go anywhere. Is that common? Absolutely not. Is it rare? It's rarer than hen's teeth. But 
literally, we know that endo, like cancer, can metastasize anywhere. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have made a big deal about diaphragmatic and chest disease lately. Sure, it happens, but it's also very rare. But it can. How did it get there? Well, it gets there through the bloodstream. And so it can easily get there to any uh, organ uh, through the bloodstream. Okay, I mean, that great. would not be the first thing I think about, but it's definitely a possibility. Okay. So the next question is, if a patient has endo in many areas, is it addressed in one surgery or needs multiple surgeries? Uh, ideally, you want to have your entire surgery at, at one sitting. Um, and usually even a massive endo excision surgery can be and this may sound like a long time, but uh, basically four, five hours, uh, something like that, six, something like that. Within that time frame, as long as you're healthy, uh, you should be able to easily tolerate. You may not go home the same day. You may or may not, probably not, probably stay overnight, but you can do all of that. And with today's, uh, especially with robotic surgery, uh, you can basically flip it around to where you can operate in the pelvis and then you can turn it around and operate up by the diaphragm. Um, again, usually you don't have to have to operate in the chest, but if you did, you can do that at the same time. So essentially, um, I, I rarely would I, the only reason to do that is if you're operating and you really didn't discuss that you may do a bowel resection and it's not on the consent is generally frowned upon to do stuff to people that they did not consent to. So even though it's endo excision, you really have to understand the scope of it and the risks and the benefits. And if it's all discussed, it really ought to be all um, operated. Now, having said that, sometimes you can have endo, very small implants, literally everywhere. Um, that is not a surgical problem. You would have to remove all the intestine, basically. And it's also not a good idea to do multiple bowel resections. That will lead to leaks and abscesses and so forth. So you have to be judicious. You have to have a surgeon that understands what the risk benefit is at any point during the surgery. Um, but certainly if there are several nodules in different areas, they can easily be resected and that part can be sewn up as well if there are larger uh, nodules uh, anywhere on the bowel. Right, okay. So there is a chance that Instagram kicks us out in a couple of minutes. Dr. Joseph, do you have a few more minutes? If they kick us out, do you want to come back or we can do another session at another time? I know we booked your time for one hour. What's, what's your uh, schedule for today? Do you think we can come back in case they kick us out? Well, if they, yeah, if, if they kick us out, sure. And if anybody, okay. uh, if we have uh, questions, we'll keep on. Yeah. So we have some questions. I'll, if you could, uh, if, if we could go through them quicker, I so many questions. I don't know how many more Sorry. questions. <laughs> I know it's not your fault. Like so many questions. Like I never expected this many questions, and I, I hate to see people go without the, their question being answered. So, does IUD mask endometriosis elsewhere in the body? Well, I, you broke up a little bit. Does what Sorry. mask? Does IUD intrauterine device mask endometriosis? Elsewhere in the body, I... If you're talking about an IUD that produces progesterone, um, which is the Mirena IUD, um, it can certainly have a local effect on the uterus um, and adenomyosis or something like that. Um, not predictably and reliably, but it can. Uh, but it really is designed to have a local effect, so it should not have uh, much of a systemic level of progesterone that would um, counter um, the endo and other parts of your body. Okay, good. So the next question is, can endo be found on the... So before I go, if so if this session ends and, and we never get to answer your questions, please send your questions directly to our DM and I'll, I'll try to get Dr. Vasev to answer those questions. I know he's pretty busy, so... And I'll try to answer those questions with him and direct message you in case we couldn't answer your questions. Probably this, they are going to disappear if the session cuts. So uh, can endo be found under adhesion attachment sites such as bowel and abdominal wall? 
In general, uh, adhesions is exactly where you go look for things. Um, so the first target, especially if I'm operating on somebody who has had prior surgery, uh, that's where I look first. Um, you're going to find endo and in the other stuff I do, cancer growing in those areas. Um, it's interesting as to why, but it looks like the healing process of that area is related to where endo cells might feel comfortable growing because all of the uh, factors that lead to your body's healing and creating the adhesions and fibrosis and so forth contribute to an environment where growth can occur. Uh, so that's definitely one area that you would uh, biopsy and remove if they're uh, looking like it could obstruct the intestine, for example. You can have Adhesions can be thin and filmy, or they could be like guitar strings, and they could lead to an obstruction of, of the bowel. So those really ought to be removed uh, right. during an endo excision surgery. All right. Um, so the next question is, is there a link between migraines and endometriosis and joint pain? Again, it, you know, endo is an inflammatory process. So um, a number of different uh, answers to this, but if you're talking about joint pain, it depends on what kind, for example. If it's an immune-based process that's going on, remember one of the theories behind the genesis of uh, endometriosis is immune-based. So there definitely is a overlap that can be occurring there. Um, so, I mean, the short answer is yes. The exact interrelationship is fuzzy uh, but clearly there there is a relationship yeah okay great so the, the next question is what factors should we consider when deciding whether or not to take birth control or hormonal medications after excision surgery her doctor obviously is pushing it on her yeah so the answer is we don't know um, if you're talking about certainly hormonal therapy to just cut off ovarian function and put someone in the menopause and risk bone health and things like that, this is not the way to go these days. Um, that just uh, is potentially going to uh, reduce uh, some, uh, some pain maybe, but it's at the risk of, of feeling awful because you're in menopause at age 30 or something like that. So that's out, but uh, well, in most cases, I would say that's out. As far as hormone replacement uh, afterwards, I think we kind of covered that. So I think we're talking about perimenopause and folks that are maybe in their 40s or something like that with birth control. You could take birth control up to, um, up to menopause and even beyond that a little bit. There are some risk factors. So if you're a smoker, you probably shouldn't be on birth control pills. But other than that, you can be on oral contraceptives. Do they help is the question. And the answer is that there are variable data out there that say that it should reduce the uh, formation of cysts on ovaries, which can reduce pain. It can potentially reduce uh, endometrioma formation, bleeding into those cysts. Um, it, it, you know, it, basically it can, from the body, kind of looking at the entire body of literature, it's supposed to be able to um, downgrade any growth. But what is this data based on? Usually it's symptom related and ultrasound. So if you're looking at, okay, half the people get a birth control pill, half the people don't, and what happens? Often it's like, well, are there any endometriomas growing back, which is one endpoint, and the other, is there any pain more in one or the other? It's usually not reoperation, which is the gold standard. You would have to go in, operate, and see what's going on. There are precious few of those kind of studies uh, in the endometriosis literature. So that's the reason I say we don't know for sure. But from the data that says less pain potentially and less endometrioma formation, yeah, it does exist out there. So taking a, uh, depending on how you uh, otherwise react to birth control pills, there's obviously a lot of them. Um, you can adjust to something that may um, definitely help you more than hurt you. Um, I would not go off and start taking a bunch of uh, 
bioidentical stuff that really you're kind of mixing and matching and you don't really know what it's creating. I realize there's all sorts of ways to test and so forth. It's just too unpredictable. Uh, so you're injecting another variable. Not that I'm against natural or homeo, you know, uh, holistic approaches, but it's just for this purpose, I don't think it's the greatest idea. Right. Uh, Dr. Wasil, are you taking new patients? Someone is asking. Yes, I am. Okay, great. Um, so I am asking, I'm reading, I'm reading other questions. Uh, all right, so I am reading the next question. So endometriosis excision by an expert should only be one. Why is endometriosis not? Con all right, so someone is asking if endometriosis excision by an expert should result in only one surgery. Why is endometriosis is not con why is why, why is endometriosis not considered cured or curable if you are talking about one surgery and done? So, again, it depends on the extent of surgery to some extent, and there are really no studies that compare lousy surgery to really good surgery. It's just not there. So you have to extrapolate. And how do you extrapolate? Well, you know, the experts probably do better surgery than non-experts, for example. But there really, there's, it, it's hard to tell exactly what, what is a primo excision surgery. Having said that, what, you know, in principle, what is it? Well, you're removing all the endo that you can see. That's the problem right there. Even if you use techniques, which I use, for example, using special dyes or looking very close to the peritoneum with magnification, you can do it with robotics or with laparoscopy, looking for tiny lesions, you're still removing lesions you can see. Microscopically, there are still potentially lesions left behind because it's more difficult to remove all the peritoneum in your in your pelvis than it is to just take all the skin off your arm for example and it's the same idea it, the, the peritoneum is your internal skin it covers everything and endo can be growing anywhere in the abdomen and pelvis on those areas so unless you literally strip all the all of the tissue out and even then with deep infiltrating you could potentially leave something behind um, because it's a little bit deeper than what you resected because you're doing the best you can visually uh, but in the end there can still be pockets that are just a little literally two millimeters deeper and you didn't remove it because you couldn't see it um, so uh, the point is that with a really really good surgery where you excise a lot of those rather than take out little pieces here and there uh, you're likely to remove most or maybe all of it um, but um, unfortunately, unless you take out all the peritoneum, which is pretty much impossible, you can't guarantee that you've cured it. Um, again, this is a surgical approach, right? We're talking surgery. At a molecular level, there's a whole lot more going on. Is the peritoneum transforming into endometriosis, which is another theory of how endo I mean, so there's too much going on that, um, you know, could say, well, you just had a crappy surgery. That's not necessarily true. Um, it could just be that you have uh, a type of endo that is just slated to return for because of the, the type of it. Not everybody has the same reason for endos, I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, we wish there was, was something like that so we can attack it, but that's not true. Uh, so... Again, basically, um, great surgery, yes, likely to be a whole lot more successful, but it's not necessarily curative. Okay, great. The next question is, so basically this is the last question uh, in this series, I'll, I'll look it up. So if, if it cuts out, we, are, we almost answered all the questions. Can endometriosis great. make you lose weight? If so, how? Um, sure, well, it, it, part of it is that if you are afflicted with endo and you have problems eating because of that. So people get early satiety, they have pain after eating, which by the way, can also be gallbladder, so you gotta watch out. But if it's not that, you're eating and, and you just don't feel good, you eat less, you're gonna lose weight. Um, that's a very significant part of it. Um, endo by itself, just growing there um, is not going to 
lead to weight loss per se. There's no plausible mechanism there, but because of what endo affects the intestine, your st well, your intestine is your your gut is everything, but it can affect your stomach. It can affect small intestine um, and large intestine, and just make you feel like you don't want to eat very much. Then you're going to lose weight. Okay, great. So the, the the other question is, is excision worth it? I am on noradrenaline and not getting a period. So my symptoms are tolerable. Should I go under excision surgery? Well, that's kind of a loaded question to answer in a forum like this. Uh, however, um, I would say that uh, it depends on how much is suspected that you have based on physical exam, MRI, um, your symptoms uh, specifically, the what's going on. Uh, so again, I'll keep hammering on everybody's an individual, so you can't really say the same thing for everybody. But if after a um, evaluation, you definitely see disease and you've been on medical therapy for a while, then it may be worth operating uh, and removing the bulky disease. If you remember, MRI is not perfect, but it's pretty good. So if you have an MRI that's completely clean, you see all the peritoneal surfaces, there's no little nodules or anything like that, and you're in reasonably uh, tolerable shape with the medication, um, you know, it's not it's not crazy to continue because, again, there is a risk-benefit to surgery as well. Complications do happen from surgery. Uh, so really, when I assess a patient, I look at all of that. I mean, you have to look at the total risk and the total benefit potential and then weigh it out and see, you know, what is, um, is it going to be um, very beneficial, a little beneficial, totally unclear, how much risk is there? All of that has to be on the table. And then you make a decision on, on that point. But just generically, like I said, an exam and possibly an MRI in, in case you're describing may, uh, may help. All right, thank you. So there is this, uh, we have two other questions just came in. Uh, so we answered these two questions, then we can close this session. I think we have taken so much time of Dr. Vasilev. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vasilev. I mean, you have been so generous with your no, time. I'll you. go for the next question. Uh, so I had an incomplete colonoscopy due to scar tissue and stricture, so they couldn't complete the colonoscopy. So uh, due to scar tissue and a stricture colon, she also had endometriosis. Is it likely that the cause of this stricture and a scar and that would be the surgery? Uh, is this likely that, this, that endo is the cause of this and what would the surgery need to do for it? Sure. Um, it, it, well, it, it definitely is a strong possibility uh, that the stricture, which is based on fibrosis around the colon that causes that tightening where the, the, the GI uh, surgeon that's looking through the colon from below sees it's tightened and there's no obvious lesions or anything like that inside the colon. I mean, sometimes it'll grow all the way through, but doesn't sound like it did here, but definitely it can constrict from the outside. Um, obviously, you have to be careful and make sure nothing else could be going on, but when you don't see a lesion inside the colon, first of all, it's not endo growing all the way through, and number two, it's not colon cancer, which is great um, because endo is obviously better than something like that. But a scarring process like endo is highly likely to cause stricture, the only other thing that would be likely to cause that is if you have uh, diverticulosis and you had especially diverticulitis episodes. So diverticulosis is just little outpouchings, and if they didn't mention it on the colonoscopy, you probably don't have it. Those outpouchings sometimes get infected and cause fibrosis, same idea, it's strictures. But other than that, um, endo, when you know you have endo, that's certainly a leading candidate for uh, causing stricture. How to treat it? Um, sometimes not all strictures are the same. It could be circumferential or it could be just a band kind of bringing it together on one side. So it could be resected and the bowel kind of opens up. Um, you won't know that until the surgeon's actually doing the surgery. That may involve 
uh, surgery, which just releases the fibrosis and removes it from the surface or even into the superficial layers of the colon. It may involve taking a disc out of that colon part, or it may involve resecting the whole area and putting it back together using a stapler. So it needs to be done by somebody that can do all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and that could either be, again, somebody like uh, myself or uh, a GYN oncologist or a team where there is a um, colorectal surgeon uh, involved. Okay, great. So this is the last question. Uh, th this session has started since 6 p.m. EST so, and, and 3 p.m. PST. Uh, we are hoping to get these sessions repeated every Thursday between 6 to 7 or 7 to 8, well, mostly 6 to 7, sometimes 7 to 8 p.m. EST. So you can join us next week. Uh, I'm talking to audience for your questions if you have any. Um, next week, we're going to talk to a physical therapy uh, about this whole post-excision care. And I'm going to ask this question as the last questions from Dr. Vasilev. Then we we'll let you go and, and have your other things for the day, Dr. Vasilev. Uh, how common is it for endo to be found after surgical menopause? There is no reproductive organs left. I have been told by my surgeon there is no way my return pain could be endo as I am in menopause. So... Um... When, I guess the, a, a question, the answer to this it, it would be when they did the surgery to remove everything, was there significant endo there or left behind or not? Uh, if there was, then clearly growth could have occurred and endo can be there. If there was no endo at that time, um, and again, it depends on, was it two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, then Less likely, however, it is a number of reasons why this is possible. First of all, when ovaries are removed, especially if there's any scar, a, a piece of the ovary can be left behind depending on who the surgeon was. Sometimes, even if the surgeon looks like they've removed the entire ovary, there can be what's called ovarian rests, which are as the ovary descends when you're an embryo, Basically, it gets stuck in, in areas as you go down the uh, blood supply to the ovary. So there can be particles of ovarian tissue left behind. Those can certainly generate endometriosis. Um, and again, endometrio, why does endometriosis occur? If it's tissue metaplasia, meaning the peritoneum uh, from stem cells develops into endo, then any degree of estrogen uh, including very, very low doses, which could be anything you're taking. It could be fat cells. It could be what's called xenoestrogens, uh, which is um, essentially toxins in the environment that act like a hormone, uh, which can actually store in your body fat cells as well. So you can kind of have a double whammy of your own production as well as the stored xenoestrogens. So there is estrogen. It has not gone away. Uh, it's just less when there's no ovaries, that's for sure. But again, remember what I said earlier, if you have a lot of very active estrogen receptors in the tissue, you don't need much estrogen to stimulate endometriosis growth. Um, so these are uh, all factors where you can't say never. Um, you can say more or less likely, depending on the questions I asked earlier about when they operated, was there any endo at all or not, and was it all removed? Uh, but I, I would, with this disease, I, you know, I don't think I'd ever say never, say never kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's always possible. All right. All right. So, um, River, the answer is, it's more common than your gynecologist think. There, there might be lesions left, and estrogen can be produced in the body. And with that, uh, I think that's a great question to conclude because you kind of concluded, touched on everything that you already discussed, Dr. Vasilev. Uh, thank you very much. This was such a great conversation. I really appreciate it that you put time to answer patients' questions. And also you people who are in this life, thank you for being here and asking your questions. Please come to next week and the week after that with your questions. Hopefully we have more sessions with Dr. Vasilev. And thanks. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Vasilev, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for all the positive feedback from everyone. And I'm sorry we didn't get every last question answered, but we'll, we will get to you one way or the other. Or the other. <laughs> yes. Thank you.
Thank you and take care. Take care, right. everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.